Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode. I am really excited to start a new project today, and today we're going to play with databases. Now, if you're unfamiliar with databases, I'm going to give you a one minute overview. If you have a lot of data that you want to keep track of, generally, our starting place is a table. So uh, think an Excel spreadsheet. We would have headers and we would keep it, uh, we'd have each column say something different. So for example, if I want a list of students, I'd have a spreadsheet and each of the columns would have name, student number, uh, homeroom class, whatever kind of information you want in there. Databases are like a whole bunch of these tables linked together. So let me just grab this for you guys real quick. Hopefully you can see that on screen. Um, so this right here is what you would have on a spreadsheet. The student has a name, has a school they go to, homeroom, birthday, that's perfect for one table. But what if you start, if you want to capture more information about the school? Well, you could start breaking down and start saying school uh, name, school uh, address. And that's a really poor way of doing it because if a thousand students all go to the same school, you would have the same information over and over and over. So uh, say Sir Winston Churchill School, you'd have that same name crop up over and over, same address. And if for some reason that school changes its address, more likely changes its phone number, you have like a thousand cells to change. So that's a terrible approach. What you want to do is start linking these. So. Instead, we have a school ID and we have a separate table with a school ID and then all of the, all of the relevant information you want. So name, number of students, principal, teachers, so on. And databases just keep growing because within that school, you'll want to know who the principal is and you don't want uh, all of that information crammed into somewhat of an irrelevant table. You want a separate table, the principal table. So uh, you'd have principal ID and you would link to that. And so how this would look is, for example, a student. Uh, I'm a student, Anson, and I have, uh, I go to school number 33. And so school number 33 has a name of, say, Churchill and has uh, 150 students. Uh, their principal is principal number 41, 41, and it's just uh, Mr. Simpson, let's say. Um, and teachers, they may have teacher number 37, uh, 101, 332, uh, and so on. And, and we just keep going down that list so that you would have the name of number 332, uh, Mrs. Simpson. Okay. And so in a database, all of these are linked together. It's not separate files. It's just uh, all in one kind of uh, one single container. Now, if you're confused, don't worry about it. Once we dive into our project, it'll be a little clearer.
I think this is a natural st stopping point for us. I heavily, no, I basically copied wholesale from a tutorial, just a very basic bare bones database uh, schema to be used with SQL Alchemy. And, and I think this one's really well done. It sets out the basics and, and goes a little bit more detail so that we can explain it very clearly. This is a different, this is a different model that we're working with. We're not using students and schools anymore. We are using orders and items, orders as in placing orders to purchase items. And so let's take a look here. Uh, we have individual classes for orders and items. So you can think of these as tables. In fact, they have a table name. Each order has this order ID, and this is a primary key, meaning that when you initiate this class, meaning you just create a new item of this class, you don't need to specify a primary key. They just hand you one. And because it's a key, each one is unique. It's a unique integer. Uh, we've we've seen that before with the student example or the school ID example. You each get a number, and because this is just basic integer, there's no kind of encryption or anything. You are just getting one, two, three, four. This is order one, two, three, four, all the way to uh, 900, 9,000, 9 million, 9 billion, whatever. Uh, the next one is customer name. This is something that you have to provide. And it says here that it's a string of 30 characters, but interestingly enough, nullable false, meaning you can't leave it blank. Next is the order date. Um, it seems like you can put in a date, so you might want to back order, you want to back date an order, or you want to put in an order in the future. You can do that, but by default, they just check uh, what the current time is right now. So when you initiate it, when you create an order, you don't need to provide a date. It just defaults what's currently there. Uh, this next piece is a relationship. So um, I think we will get into that a bit later, but uh, the next bit is uh, the item. Basically the same thing. We have item ID, we have a description, and we have a price. Price is a float number basically so um again also not nullable so you have to provide it when you initiate it okay um so i just jotted this down really quickly beforehand naturally you would think there is this relationship of order items and you would tie that to item id that is that is fine um, that is one approach that makes perfect sense. And you would just have a whole bunch of item IDs here. That's pretty terrible writing here. Um, but you would have IDs placed here and you would just have, say, a list of IDs. You bought item 1, 2, 3, 4, 74, 73 in... Um, in that order. This example that they gave us is a little more, it's a little more advanced. They created a third item called, they created a third table called order item. So that's this one here. And what's interesting is instead of this relationship right here, they have decided to create a relationship like this and like this instead. And there's only one reason you would want to do this because all they're doing here for these first two items right here is the order ID and item ID. That doesn't give us any new information. The only reason why you would create a new table like this is if you want to embed another piece of information. So if I just did these two, that relationship, all I know is the order ID, item ID. There's no 
there's no additional information. So in this case, they are saying that in the order, you might get a different price. So say you bought a baseball bat. Normally, the list price over here is $9.99, but for whatever reason, that person might have had a coupon code or something, you got it for $7.99. So they want to keep track of that. Even though the item has a price, in the order, you can have a, a price that is different from whatever the item comes with. That makes sense. I think more intuitively, at least for me, what usually happens when you break out an item like this is you want the order. Uh, terrible choice of words. Um, you want the sequence information. So in this case, when we did order items, we would have order item one, two, three, four, five. And depending on how you put it in, you might have gone two, three, four, five, one, two, three, five, four, one. Um, there's no real order and whatever you put it in, that's what you get. But if you have a sequence and you want to be able to shuffle items up and down on, on your list, um, that makes a difference. So for example, item ID is just given uh, based on when you put the item in. I put in xylophones that shows up first and then I can put apples next. There's no logical order, it's just whatever happened first. Um, but later on, you may want to alphabetize, I don't know why you would want to do that, your orders. So you can put in a sequence so that even though apple came in second, you will give it a ranking of one and then xylophone will get a ranking of two or something else. So uh, that's how I've used uh, a breakout table like this in the past. Uh, but the price makes sense as well. So hopefully you're getting a sense of why you would start building a database. Uh, I think my next step is to actually put this into Azure. So um, that's kind of the next step. And then depending on how long that takes, this might be a very short video, but um, for now, oh, actually, uh, let's explain really quickly what, what the run function did here. So SQL Alchemy has this has the ability to use an SQL light table locally on your computer. And even better, I don't think it's over here, but uh, somewhere earlier on in one of my earlier versions, it didn't even have to create an actual file. It just kind of ran it in memory because it knows that people might be creating these tables at a very <clears throat> early, um, very early stage. They just want to make sure that the connections make sense. They're not putting in a whole lot of data. So uh, having it run in memory is a brilliant idea. So I enjoy that very much. I don't know if we're actually using it based on this, but um, ignore me. Uh, first thing that happened is we put in four different items, t-shirt, mug, hat, crowbar. We added them all and then we committed. So we put them into, we, we finalized it and decided to put it into the database. We created an order by John Smith and then we created these order items. Um, each one was added to the list of order items in the order. And then finally, the most powerful thing about a database is that uh, people have been pouring over these systems for years and years and years decades, and they found very efficient ways to query it, meaning filtering, finding information in a database. So in this example, and I'm just going to remove this out of confusion, but you would query an order. So you're looking for an order and you're filtering so that you want orders where the customer is John Smith makes total sense. And then here, you know, for each order, you print out the description and the price. Okay. Um, this next one, you want to find, uh, no, what is here? 
customers who bought MySQL crowbar on sale. Okay, so what's interesting is you're looking for an item description with MySQL crowbar, and you want to make sure that the price of the item is greater, meaning their the default price of the crowbar is higher than the price associated in the order. So um, there's there's so many ways you can start filtering. So if you kept date uh, of the of the order, you can kind of search filter by date. You can order, um, meaning make the sequence. So you can alphabetize it, or you can do it by uh, how far back in time. So um, this actually looks very similar to Django. So I think this will be fairly easy to pick up, but. Uh, I guess that's irrelevant. All I want to do next is to push this this example into Azure. So uh, you've heard me talk enough, um, but uh, leave a comment below if you have any questions. I'll be happy to answer them as best I can. But the next steps is to bring this into Azure. All right, we are here at the best part now. So what we're going to try and do is actually create an SQL database. Um, you'll find that Microsoft has really good documentation and unlike Azure Functions where we had trouble with the serverless, they are very clear in terms of how you would do this serverless um, and, and keep the costs way down. So um, I'm gonna be following this on the side, but you guys can uh, follow along how I am doing this. So first of all, you want to find Azure SQL. When you click onto it, you get to this page. You go add. And under this particular card, you want to make sure that you are creating a single database. You'll create, pick, you know, whichever subscription or resource group you want. I'm going to create a new one, uh, random SQL database. You probably want a better name than this one. Um, and I have a real hard time sticking to naming conventions. So uh, that is a bad habit that uh, I hope to kick one of these days. We need to create a new server. Oh, uh, I am just gonna move this off screen, but you guys can take a really quick look here. You need a server name. You'll get an admin login password. So obviously we wanna make sure that I am doing this off screen. So uh, I've moved it to US West, but let's just pick a... We want to select no to SQL Elastic Pool. And then here is where we get to pick serverless. So um, we're configuring the server and we want to pick serverless. This will bring the cost way down to six bucks a month. Um, we've scrolled down V cores all the way down. And you know, I I don't think this is all that important if you are using the database as kind of a personal storage. I keep thinking one of the first things that I want to use this for is storing information as I'm scraping a website. Um, so that's just one connection. I will connect to the database from time to time to put information in there and to take information back out. But um, if you're building an app, say, um, Wikipedia or something where you envision a lot of people will be 
putting information in and taking information out, then uh, this will start to matter. And as you move up, the cost is supposed to go up. I'm not sure why it's not. But um, at a certain point, it will flip from it will flip from being better value uh, on a serverless instance to a provision instance. So um, this seems very, very high, but uh, we'd be able to configure this downwards and bring it to, I'd say reasonably 20 or 30 bucks a month, but serverless, you can bring it way down. And right now, uh, most of the cost is in the data side. So really, I am doing this purely for testing. I think, oh, oh, that is really interesting. Um, remember, we were looking at the pricing calculator and at f they said there is a minimum of five gigs. That brings it up to about a dollar Canadian a month. Um, if we bring it down to one, which wasn't possible, 19 cents is great. <clears throat> I can't see myself using more than a gig. I am doing this just as a test server, but I think five gigs is actually a good size if you want to build it into an app and do something interesting with it. But for now, this is entirely a test uh, for me, and I might just do a couple of transactions here and there. 19 cents a month sounds great for a gig. Um, okay, yeah, uh, I, I don't even think I should mess with these ones. Change the configuration. No, I don't think you have an option in the server list, so you have to use one of these. Anyways, uh, that looks great. Um, so let's see, it is 0 0.02 cents every second you use. Let's bring out a calculator here. So 0 0.02 cents, uh, and they suggested that we use we should use about 60 minutes a month, so 3,600 seconds. So that's about 72 cents a month for the computing cost if we use a full 60 minutes. Again, since I am the only one interacting with this, I can't see myself using more than a minute or two, but um, I think... 60 minutes with about five five gigs of storage you're looking at about two bucks a month for something that is usable on a small scale okay um let's go next to networking uh network connectivity um this is pretty interesting um I'm just going to leave it to no access for now. I assume that means they will give me some password access. Oh, I see. Okay. I, I think this might be uh, sharing access with other, other resources. So if you have a blob storage, then this might give it easier access. So uh, I'm not so worried about that. I'm going to start with a blank data source. Relation. Not sure about that. I am not going to go with this defender. Thanks. Uh, I'm not so worried about this. Okay, let's create. Okay, and usually it takes it takes a few minutes to actually get this running. So uh, we will look back here. Really, all I'm expecting is uh, a bit of code here, entering the username and password and being able to connect to this database. I find it interesting they didn't ask us what type of database this is, whether it's MySQL or something else. That is 
that worries me a little bit, but maybe that's because we don't have any any creation, any data in there yet. Anyways, uh, I don't expect this to work immediately, so I'm gonna turn the sound off and take a break, and then I'm gonna jump back into the code and hopefully get this all live and running. And we're done. This was a super short, simple project. Most of this code came straight from a tutorial and the rest of it, this little piece to connect to Azure just came straight out of Stack Overflow. So um, we have not done a any real lifting at all, but you need to understand that this is incredibly useful. The concept of building a schema like this one is portable to so many apps. If you are building anything at all that has a lot of data that's pretty organized and structured that you want to filter, search, query, that you want to dig into, 99% um, chance you are using a database in the background. These concepts from SQL Alchemy of building out a schema is universal. They have abstracted it a little bit, so um, made it easier for you, but the concept crosses from Python to anywhere. So if you're building a site with Ruby on Rails, you're going to have a, a schema just like this, but slightly different syntax. If you're building, since I love Python, Flask or Django, um, you're using the same, almost the same syntax. You are doing some very similar things. So um, let's just go over our code really quickly. We imported date time just to keep track of time, but mainly this came all from SQL Alchemy. The concepts poured over very easily. Here we are importing URL lib and PyODBC. You have other options, but this is what I'm using to connect to Azure. If you're doing Google Cloud or AWS, uh, you, you might be importing different libraries and you might be doing this just a tad differently, but um, very kind of similar uh, approach. Finally, we have the secrets file. This is my own type of thing. I just need to keep my username and password away from you guys so that you know you can't you can't play around with with my with my database when I'm looking away. The schema. This is as basic as it gets. We have order item order item. Okay, it could get a little more simple. It could just be the order and the items, but. Even just building on this idea where you're going to a store and buying something, you can expand that database out to hundreds of tables. Just very obviously, you may want to keep track of what store, what location, what manufacturer, when you bought it, when you, uh, when is it in the inventory, when is it out, uh, is it on the front shelves, is it in the back? Um, and you know, those may be fields, those may be other tables. Uh, and, and the logic of it becomes more and more complex. But here we have something very simple. We just give each item an ID. We just put in some relevant uh, fields and, and things you want to keep track of. You'll note that it can be a string, date, time, it, well, float. Uh, it could be all sorts of things. And one of the important things is you're not just limited to the, the types that are available on Python, but for example, if you want media, images, uh, videos, whatever else you want in there, you can always just put a URL to a server or some storage uh, service so that you can fetch 
the media that you're looking for. So um, the sky's the limit in terms of what you can do, what you can store in these tables. Finally, we decided to run the tests. Um, we connected here. And what I want to show you guys really quickly is, and I'm not going to click into this, but this connection strings right here on the side, on the very, on the very left side of the screen, hopefully you can see it, um, is connection strings. And you actually don't have to break it out like this at all. We, I've, I've taken that because it's, I think it's good practice to break it out and it's easier to read. But Azure actually provides you just with the string. You just copy and paste right here and, and, and you're ready to go. Um, very, very simple, very, very straightforward. But in this case, we've broken it out so that there's username, password, kind of um, where you need to go. And, and we make that connection. Finally, we ran through this before, but we, we made a couple insertions into, into the da database and we did some searching as well. What I want to show you now is, is two things actually, uh, are two things. Uh, first is the query editor. Sometimes, oh, let me just log in here. Oops. Sometimes it's very hard for you to figure out what exactly this schema looks like. It's probably a good idea to draw it out, but if not, you can look at the tables themselves. So you can see what is in the table. You'll see the ID, the description, the price. And if we had more fields, you'd be able to scroll left and right. You can run SQL code as well, right from the Azure portal. Uh, it's very useful. You can save the query so you can run it all the time. You can export the data. So uh, there is a visual interface on Azure portal for you to look at. And that is that could be helpful um, if this kind of abstraction isn't isn't very clear in your mind. Excuse me. Um, the other thing I want to show you guys is that I keep mentioning that this is just a test. For me personally, I wanted to make sure that I know how to connect to an Azure SQL database so that the next time I scrape a site, I can store that information on the cloud fairly organized. It's not just some CSV file that I store. There can be an actual database that we work with. Um, and it can grow. So for now, I want to scrape it so that two weeks later, I can be on some other computer. I can go on the Azure portal and take a look at what information is there. But I can just as easily start building an app around that information and create connections and all of that and, and expand it and grow it. Uh, this is a very useful kind of starting point. But what I really like about Azure and these online services is that you can start scaling immediately right, right in the portal. So uh, let's go into configure. Okay. And you'll recognize exactly what we set up earlier. We have a serverless setting. We're set at one gig data size. We talked about this already and that it's about 19 cents a month to, to store and 0.02 cents every second of compute that we're forcing it to do. It's very cheap, but at a certain point, if, if I do this as a test, that's enough. If I start actually putting information in, I might want to start scaling the, the data size up from, from one gig to two to three to four to a hundred. And, and yeah, the cost will increase, duh, but it's painless. I just click apply and we are good to go. Um, that has expanded for us. And remember when I said the difference between server, serverless and an actual server? Sometimes it's a matter of how many people are using it. Well, you can switch over to a provisioned 
um, server right away. You have the oof, 480 bucks a month that, that it's going to cost. That's very pricey. Um, and, and, and the sky's the limit. So if I, if I scroll this up, it, it just, it, it, it can get astronomically high. But, um, my point is that you can start small, you can start building on the cheap, and then you can start expanding and, and moving. And all you gotta do is fiddle with these sliders and click apply, and you're scaling your production up. You're ready for uh, a wave of users on your app, whether you're moving from one person testing it to your family and friends are using it to an actual user base to, to going absolutely viral and, and gigantic. Um, all of that can be handled right here on that slider. So that is really cool as well, because this little simple demonstration can be moved and, and can, can be scaled up to something, uh, something global and worldwide very, very quickly and easily. Anyways, um, I'm going to cut it off there. I think what I'm going to do in the future is uh, build on top of this, start building that app that then uh, stores information on the net. But um, because I'm new at this, if you guys give me a like, a thumbs up, or, or subscribe to me, that helps a lot. But equally important is if you leave a comment and just let me know where I'm doing well and where I'm not doing well. Uh, I know I tend to drone on a bit and I'm trying to, to tackle that, but uh, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them and I'm, I'm happy to, to uh, answer any questions that you might have. So thanks for watching and see you next time.